الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, There is so much to talk about والله that even one lecture will not do justice and it's very likely that this part two will actually be you know, uh, part two of maybe part three and four. It might actually move on later on because there's too much to discuss in even, mashallah, we have a long lecture today, but still it's too much to discuss uh, in one lecture. So let us begin. The, what I'm going to be doing at the beginning is we'll just define quickly what is sihr linguistically and then move on to two of the main stories in the Quran about sihr. Two of the main stories in the Quran about sihr and then based on these two stories, we'll extract what is some of the benefits and realities of uh, sihr? And we began by talking about what is uh, sihr linguistically. Linguistically, uh, sihr means that which is hidden. That which is hidden, that which we don't understand why or it is covered. So that is why in Arabic you call the darkness of the night, what do you call it, O Arabs? Sahar, right? Because it's dark, you don't know what is happening. And that's why when you eat at that time of the night, it is called suhoor, right? Because you're eating at the darkness of the night. So uh, the term for suhoor or sihri, we call it in Urdu, is actually from the same root as sihr, not because there's any sihr in suhoor, but because suhoor is eaten at a time of darkness. So it's the, the darkness is called sahar. And that darkness means you don't know what's happening. That's why it's called darkness, uh, sahar. So sihr means that which takes place and you don't know why it's taking place. The cause is unknown. This is really what the linguistic meaning of sihr is. And from a theological, from an Islamic standpoint, sihr is to invoke the aid of the jinn to do something that appears to be from our world supernatural. So the jinn will cause something to happen and because we do not see the jinn, so it seems as if we don't understand. Even though once we understand sihr, we do understand how it happens. But from those who, for those who don't study Islamic theology, it will appear, how did this happen? Where did this come from? And that is why sihr is called sihr. Now there are two main stories that we're gonna concentrate on before we get to the, the, the meat of the matter. And these stories are introductions to the reality of sihr. And both of them are Quranic stories about uh, sihr. Uh, the first of them is the story of, what is the most famous story of magic in the Quran? Musa. The most famous story of magic in the Quran deals with uh, Musa. And there are multiple narrations in the Quran, multiple ayat, I should say, about the reality of uh, magic. And uh, some of them, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, uh, We showed Fir'aun all of our signs. Fir'aun said that, O oh Musa, have you come to drive us out of our land through your magic? We shall bring a magic just like yours. So let us set a time that we both agree to. Let's set a time that we will both come together and uh, we will invite the people. Suwa, all of them will come together to see what we are uh, doing. So Musa said, Your appointment will be on the day of festivities. They must have had an Eid. They must have had some major celebration coming up. So Musa said, the very day that everybody's going to be coming together, Yom Zina, that is the day we are going to have our showdown. I'm going to bring what I have and you bring what you have. And the people will be all over there. And let the people gather at the time of Duha, which is early morning, 9 a.m., 10 a.m. At that time, they will all gather together. So Fir'aun gathered together his lands and he, uh, his plans, excuse me, and he uh, came and he came back. Now, this is Surah Taha, I'm quoting you. In Surah A'raf, uh, Allah tells us that what did Fir'aun do? Uh, and also in um, so is Surah Ma'idah, which, uh, which other surah I'm not remembering right now. But Allah Azza wa tells us what did Fir'aun do? Fir'aun said, فَأَرْسَلَ فِرْعَوْنُ فِي الْمَدَائِنِ حَاشِرِينَ Fir'aun sent criers throughout all of Egypt. What were these cries supposed to do? 
Bring bikulli sahir and alim. Bring forth every knowledgeable sahir, not just a mediocre sahir. He wanted the cream of the crop. He wanted the experts to come. Fajumi'a sahar. All of the sahara came. And this is in the palace of Fir'aun. This is in the palace of Fir'aun. And it is understood from the story that the magicians would have concocted amongst themselves their planning, their getting together, their magic. And the magicians say to Fir'aun, أَإِنَّ لَنَا لَأَجْرًا إِن كُنَّا نَحْنُ الْغَالِبِينَ Are we going to get some prize if we win? So the, the magicians, even though they are talking to the most powerful man alive, they want to know what's in it for us. What are we going to get? And so Fir'aun says, yes indeed, you will get some prize and you shall be lamin al-muqarrabin. I will make you close to me. Meaning there might be more opportunities later on. So if you pass this, you will get what you want and you will get a high uh, position. Now this is not in Surah Taha, this is in uh, Surah uh, Surah Al-Ma'idah and also in Surah Al-A'raf. So we get back to Surah Taha that now the magicians come in front. On one side is the magician, on one side is Musa alayhi salam. And then Musa says to the magicians, وَيْلَكُمْ لَا تَفْتَوْرْ عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا فَيُسْحِتَكُمْ بِعَذَابٍ وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ افْتَرَى Woe to you! Do not lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Musa accuses the magicians of being a fraud. So Musa says, you're lying. And don't lie right in front of Allah and lie against Allah as if you have some powers. So Musa accuses the magicians of being frauds. This is an important point here. You're not real. You're pretending to have something you don't have. And you don't actually have it. And so Musa says, fear Allah. You're lying right in front of Allah about Allah, meaning as if you have some superhuman or divine powers, you don't have them. And uh, the magicians gathered together and they said, who, which one of us is going to go first? Which one of us is going to be first? So uh, Musa said, Bal alqu. you go ahead and do what you want. Bal alqu. So hibalahum wa isiyahum. The magicians threw their sticks and their ropes. فَأَلْقَوْ حِبَالَهُمْ وَعِصِيَّهُمْ They threw their sticks and their ropes. وَقَالُوا بِعِزَّةِ فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّا نَحْنُ غَالِبُونَ And they said, by the izza of Fir'aun, we are going to win. So they did not invoke Allah. There's another point. The magicians never invoke Allah. The magicians invoked someone other than Allah. And in this case, they're invoking a false god. Because what did Fir'aun say he is? Fir'aun said he is God himself. So they invoked a false God. And so Allah Azza wa Jal says that, uh, and this is in Surah Al-A'raf, فَأَلْقُوا حِبَالَ مُعَصْ... Uh, no, uh, in Surah Al-A'raf, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal says, تَخَيَّلُوا uh, يَسَحْنَا أَنَّهَا تَسْعَى What is the Arabic? تَخَيَّلُوا, not تَخَيَّلُوا. I'm forgetting the Arabic here. They... They made it appear from their magic as if the ropes were moving. As if the ropes were moving. So, and another verse, Allah says, They bewitched the eyes of the people. So this shows us that at some occasions, not all of them, magic is not actually real. It's an illusion. Because according to the ayat, the ropes were not moving. Saharu a'yun nas They bewitched the eyes of the people. And in another verse, they made it appear through their magic that the ropes were wiggling. And therefore the ropes were not actually wiggling. The ropes were not moving. The magic was in to make it appear as if they were moving. And by the way, this is street magic. It's very basic magic. Because remember, what, what did Musa do? The Musa converted his staff to an actual snake, right? This is what he did, a real live snake. And Fir'aun saw this, and the minister saw this, but these weren't the magicians. The magicians didn't see the initial miracle. So the magicians are told he can make his staff appear like a snake. So the magician said, no worry, we can do the same as well, don't worry. So the magicians plotted and planned. And the magician said, we can also do this. So they threw their ropes and they didn't actually forget converting them to snakes. The ropes didn't even move. 
but the sihr made it appear to the eyes of the people that that they had uh, moved. So uh, when Musa saw all of these ropes moving around, he himself became worried. Can I match this or not? Musa. So Musa himself became scared. So this shows us that magic is so powerful that perhaps even believers in Allah and prophets can feel trepidation at it. Musa knows it's not true. He doesn't believe in the magic. But it is so powerful that he himself is wondering, can I match it or not? Right? So, فَأَوْجَسَ فِي نَفْسِ خِيفَةَ مُوسَى قُلْنَا لَا تَخَفْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْأَعْلَى Allah said, don't worry, you are going to win. وَأَلْقِ مَا فِي يَمِينِكَ تَلْقَفْ مَا صَنَعُوا Go ahead and throw what is in your hands. It shall swallow up and destroy what they have done. And so when Musa threw his uh, staff, it didn't just pretend to wiggle, it became a massive live python or whatever, a massive snake. It became a living, breathing snake. Now, the most amazing thing happens, we all know, that when the Sahara saw this live snake, instantaneously, فَأُلْقِيَ السَّحَرَةُ سُجَّدًا قَالُوا آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ هَارُونَ وَمُوسَى The magicians who are the experts in this craft, when they see what Musa is coming with, they realize this is not magic. This is the real deal. And that is the creation of life. And so from being the worst of the worst, they convert to the best of the best. And Fir'aun is of course humiliated. Can you imagine? These are the creme de la creme of the whole Egyptian society of, of magicians, right? And by the way, the art of magic reached one of its zeniths in the time of ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt was immersed in magic, in sihr. And can you imagine, it is my hypothesis, and Allah knows best, but I can't see anything else happening that would have done this. It is my hypothesis that never in the history of humanity have such a large group of magicians actual Sahara collaborated together for a project of such a high quality even because Egypt was known for its magic and generally speaking Sahara don't cooperate together just like you know the mafia whatever they don't cooperate each one is happy with what he's doing and they don't want to cooperate now they have a higher power Fir'aun who's willing to pay them big bucks to cooperate so he gets the team of the best specialists in the world of a society that is known to this day to have excelled in sihr. And they are all cooperating. And so this is what they can bring forth. And lo and behold, in front of Fir'aun, the height of humiliation, they all reject Fir'aun. And they say, we believe in the God of Musa. And so Fir'aun does only what he can do, which is a tyrant. He says, I'll kill you all. And look at the iman of these people, literally in one second how it has gone from where to where. In one second, they said, La Bayr, go ahead, do what you want. Because this is the real God who has done this. And we're gonna go back to him and we have to believe in the Rabb of Musa. Fir'aun says, La usalli bandakum fi judu'in naql. I'm gonna crucify you on date palms. Wala and you're gonna see who amongst us is the more powerful. And so they said, Go ahead. In the end of the day, we're going to go back to him and not you. Our souls will go back to him and not uh, you. So what this really shows us is that magicians and magic is some type of illusion that in reality, magic does not cause something which is supernatural. Now I'll explain this. Don't mis don't, don't just you know under, misunderstand me. What the magi well, sorry what the jinns do, what the magicians do, is something that might appear supernatural to us, but in reality it is not competing with Allah's power. Anything that the jinn and the magicians do is something that is utterly trivial compared to the actual power of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And once we understand what 
sihr and jinn is, then wallahi, we're not going to be scared of it at all. And one of the goals of this class, and every time I teach this, I say this, one of the goals of teaching you what is the reality of sihr is, when you study it, you will no longer be that terrified of it. You will be as terrified of it as you are of some type of, you know, maybe a snake or a predator, something like this. It's going to be a natural fear. And it's not going to be something that is, oh, I don't understand it, it's supernatural. And that fear, inshallah, cannot come from the heart of an actual uh, believer. So we learn from the story of Musa that there is something called sihr. And one type of sihr is to bewilder the eyes of the people. Now, this doesn't mean that sihr is never something that can happen that's actual. Maybe another type of sihr can cause it to move. Now, one can say, what's the big deal of causing a rope to move? That seems to be very trivial. The big deal was not in the rope moving, the big deal was in bewildering and bewitching the eyes of millions of people. That's the quantity of sihr that was done. That indeed some type of sihr is more powerful than causing a rope to move. In reality, some types of sihr is more powerful than causing a rope to move. But what was powerful about this group was they, they did a mass illusion over hundreds and thousands, maybe millions of people. And that was the, the power that they had. But they couldn't actually create real life. So when they saw real life, instantaneously they accepted Islam. The second story is actually more relevant to us and that is the story of Sulaiman. That is the story of Sulaiman. And this is Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 102. And this is the most explicit re reference to Sihr in the whole Quran. And that's why we need to discuss it in detail. This is the most explicit reference to sihr in the Quran. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاتَّبَعُوا مَا تَتْلُوا الشَّيَاطِينُ عَلَى مُلْكِ سُلَيْمَانِ وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانِ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى الْمَلَكَيْنِ بِبَابِلَ هَارُوتَ وَمَارُوتَ وَمَا يُعَلِّمَانِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ حَتَّى يَقُولَ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةٌ فَلَا تَكْفُرْ فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُمَا مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِّينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مَا يَضُرُّهُمْ وَلَا يَنْفَعُهُمْ وَلَقَدْ عَلِمُوا لَمَنْ اشْتَرَاهُ مَالُهُ فَآخِذِهِ مِنْ خَلَاقٍ وَلَبِئْسَ مَا شَرَوْا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ I recited the whole verse because it is very very important and we will spend a good solid 15 minutes just on this verse uh, breaking it up and, and trying to understand what each phrase says. وَاتَّبَعُوا مَا تَتْلُوا الشَّيَاطِينُ عَلَى مُلْكِ سُلَيْمَانِ So it is Surah Al-Baqarah verse 102 and make sure you write this down and go back and read it in uh, context. Now, the verse before uh, this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the Yahud threw away the book of Allah. They threw away the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they, instead of following the book of Allah, what did they follow? So Allah says, وَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ مُصَدِّقُ لِمَا مَعَهُمْ نَبَذَ فَرِيقٌ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا كِتَابُ كِتَابُ اللَّهِ وَرَاءَ ظُهُورِهِمْ When the book came with the Prophet, they knew. They threw away this book behind their backs. And they rejected the Prophet even though they knew that this is the Prophet. So they did not follow the book. What did they follow? Instead of following the book of Allah, they followed that which the shayateen recited during the time of Sulaiman. Is that clear so far? Right? Instead of following the Quran, they followed the recitations of the shayateen during the time of Sulaiman. Okay, what is this recitation of shayateen? What were the shayateen reciting? We have many uh, opinions, but uh, to summarize, there's like four or five, and I have all of them here, but uh, no need to go into opinion one, opinion two, and three. What appears to have been the case is that the jinns and the shayateen during the time of Sulaiman, or maybe after his death, maybe right after his death is another opinion, they claim to have the knowledge of Sulaiman. Or according to one interpretation, they claim to have discovered the secrets of Sulaiman. Now pause here. What secrets of Sulaiman? How he controlled the jinn and the animals. How he controlled the jinn and the animals. Now I don't need to tell you, or maybe I do need to tell you, I don't know. We all should know, uh, those of us that have studied a little bit of Islam, that Sulaiman was given something that nobody else was given. We know this. Sulaiman was given 
something that no other prophet was given, no other person was given. And that's what the dua he made to Allah. Rabbi habli mulkan la yanbaghi li ahadin bin ba'di. Oh Allah, give me a power. Mulk here doesn't just mean a kingdom, it means the power, the mulukiya, the, the kingdom or the control that no one after me will have. So Allah says, because of his dua, we gave him the power of the wind. فَسَخَّرْنَا لَهُ الرِّيحَ Right? تَجْبِ أَمْلِ الرُّخَانِ حَيْتُ أَصَابِ وَالشَّيَاطِينَ We gave him the power of the shayateen. And in other verses, we gave him the power to speak to animals. So the animals, وَحُشِرَ لِسُلَيْمَانَ جُنُودُهُ مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ وَالطَّيْرِ And all of the armies of Sulaiman, from the jinn, and the ints and the birds, all of these are armies of Sulaiman. So Sulaiman was given the power to control the jinn. Okay, and even the animals and the wind. It is said that after Sulaiman died, or according to one opinion, even while he was alive, the shayateen claimed to have unlocked his power. What was the power according to the shayateen? The shayateen said, Sulaiman knows black magic. So he's controlling the jinn through sihr, through black magic. So Allah is saying, this group of people in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, rejected the Qur'an and instead they followed the ramblings of the shayateen during the time of Sulaiman. Then Allah defends Sulaiman. وَمَا كَفَرَ Sulaiman. Sulaiman did not commit kufr. وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا Rather, it was the shayateen who committed kufr. Now the verse is very difficult to understand without context. So, I will take a step back and simply explain everything so that you understand the verse insha'Allah the, the, the story goes as follows. And this is one interpretation, but again, there are we don't have the time to go into various interpretations. It is said that during the time of Sulaiman, for six months or longer, the jinn somehow managed to uh, get rid of Sulaiman temporarily. This is one of the Israeliyat and many Muslim scholars also accept this opinion. That somehow they managed to catch him at a time of neglect or whatever and they managed to get him off the scene. And they started slandering and spreading rumors about him so that people lose respect for Sulaiman. And of the things that they said was that Sulaiman is a magician and that he controls the jinn through sihr. And Allah says, some of the modern Yahud believe this as well. And they're instead of following the Quran, they're following these ramblings of the shayateen. Then Allah defends Sulaiman. Sulaiman was not a kafir. وَمَا كَفَرَ Sulaiman. This shows us that practicing magic and believing in it makes you a kafir. Because the jinns accuse Sulaiman of being a magician, not of being a kafir. And Allah defended Sulaiman by saying, He didn't say Sulaiman was not a magician. Rather, Allah said Sulaiman did not commit kufr. And from this, the scholars have derived that practicing magic and believing in magic is disbelief in Allah. Clear? Right? Because Allah defended Sulaiman from kufr. وَمَا كَفَرَ Sulaiman. Sulaiman did not commit kufr. Rather, it was the shayateen who committed kufr. How did they commit kufr? يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ sihr. They were the ones teaching mankind sihr. So what is the origin of sihr? Shayateen teaching men, not Sulaiman. Sulaiman did not control the jinns through magic. How did Sulaiman control the jinns? Allah gave him the power. Allah subjugated the jinn, not magic. So what do the magicians do then? يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى الْمَلَكَيْنِ بِبَابِ لَهَا رُوتَ وَمَا رُوتَ And these people are also following وَمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى الْمَلَكَيْنِ They're also following what was revealed to the two angels in Babel. Babel is Babylon. And these two angels are called Harut and Marut. Now pause here. So this ayah is a very dense ayah. So much information is packed in it. So we have to Go bit by bit. So let's pause here. What is Babel? And what is Harut and Marut? There are again a number of opinions. Uh, some of them go back to uh, what the Jews and Christians say and we find it in our literature as well. And unfortunately, we some of our scholars have narrated this and this is not true. But I will tell you that opinion because you will find it in almost every book of Tafsir. This opinion goes back to a biblical story. The biblical story is known to some of us 
uh, and it's very known. It's very common amongst the our. Uh, Christian neighbors, they all know the story because it's a standard part of the Bible. That apparently, according to the Bible, two angels mocked the existence of man and said, look at men, how evil they are. And we can do a better job. So Allah, apparently, uh, allegedly, we don't believe the story, said to these angels, if I were to make you men and send you down and give you the temptations of men, what do you think you would do? So they said, oh, we would do a much better job. We would be worshippers, we would not do any sin. So, according to the legend, Allah sent two angels in the form of men. And they were men, i.e. they were transformed into men. And they were called Harut and Marut. And then they saw a beautiful lady and they could not control themselves. And so they committed all of the sins and zina and sharab and everything they committed. So this is Harut and Marut. And according to the Bible or according to the Israeli, uh, um, Israeliyat, they were transformed into some type of star as a punishment and they're being punished. Uh, and that star we see, according to the Israeli traditions, is actually punished, the, the angels being uh, punished. Now, unfortunately, this uh, the star is the Venus star. Uh, uh, and it's not even a star. It's, uh, the point is that we find this story and it's not in the Quran and it's not in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Rather, this is a story that's found in biblical literature and some of our scholars have taken it. And unfortunately, you find it there, but there's no basis for it. So. We don't believe that any angel was transformed to a human. But the Quran clearly says two angels came down. And these angels were called Harut and Marut. And they came to the city of Babylon. And what was revealed to the two angels at Babel, Babylon. And these two angels, Harut and Marut. Okay, so what was revealed to these two angels in Babel? Firstly, where is Babel? Where is Babylon? Iraq. Iraq. And how ancient is Babylon? It is said to be the most ancient city. There was no city before the city of Babylon to that level. The first real civilization was Babylon. So we are going back pre-Ibrahim. We're going back to the earliest of times, way before Musa, way before Sulaiman. So Allah is telling us when did magic begin? This is the story. Allah is telling us the origins. What is Sihr? And these Yehud are following what was revealed to the two angels of uh, Babylon. These were called Harut and Marut. What was revealed to these two angels? So a number of opinions here. And really there's only two opinions that I think are plausible and the rest I'll just ignore. The first opinion that I think is plausible. There are more than two again, but these are the two that I think have some legitimacy. The first opinion is as follows, that Allah sent down two angels with the knowledge of how to control or ac access the jinn, which is magic. And the angels were sent to the city of Babylon and the angels were allowed to teach anybody who wanted to study with them the quote-unquote art of magic. But the angels also claim with a big disclaimer. And that disclaimer was, إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةٌ فَلَا تَكْفُرْ The angels said to anybody who came to them, we are a test from Allah. So do not commit kufr by studying with us. Yet, if somebody insisted, they taught him. Is that clear? So the angels are a test. And they say they're a test. And they only teach somebody after they tell them, if you study this, you will become a kafir. But they were still there. So Allah says, فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُمَا The people studied from the two of them. مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ That which would cause a husband and wife to fall apart, to have problems and whatnot. And وَمَا هُمْ بِالْبَارِّينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ They could never harm anybody unless Allah willed it. Magic is not more powerful than Allah. If Allah wants to, He can prevent it. So they're not going to harm anybody except if Allah has willed it. And, وَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مَا يَضُرُّهُمْ وَلَا يَنْفَعُهُمْ They studied that which only harms them and there is no benefit. So magic has zero benefit. Unlike alcohol, Allah says khamr has some benefit. Khamr has some benefit. This is in the Quran. But the harm outweighs the benefit. As for sihr, there's no benefit. It's only evil. And 
وَلَقَدْ عَلِمُوا And the angels taught or told the men, لَمَنْ اِشْتَرَاهُ Whoever got this knowledge from them, مَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقٍ They would have no share of the next world. You can literally purchase this world at the expense of the next. وَلَبِئْسَ مَا شَرَوْ بِهِ أَنفُسَهُمْ And what an evil price they sold themselves for, لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ If they only understood. So this is the first opinion, that the angels taught the reality of sihr. Now what is the reality of sihr? We'll come to in around 15 minutes, inshaAllah. What is the reality of sihr? Be patient upon me. We'll get there. But the angels taught them how to commit sihr. And the angels claim with a disclaimer, if you study this, you're not a Muslim. And Allah has sent us to test you. But obviously the people of Babylon insisted and they studied it. So those who studied it became the first magicians of this humanity. And all magic that is existent today somehow goes back to Babylon through their own isnads. And there are different madhahib of magic as well, by the way. It's not just one madhab. There are different madhahib and different arts and different ways within magic. They all originate at Babylon. And the knowledge that was taught, according to the first opinion, directly from the angels to mankind. Okay, this is the first opinion. The second opinion is a slightly modified version. It's really in essence the same, but slightly modified. And this opinion has also been narrated from Ibn Abbas. Uh, and it's narrated in Al-Tabari's Tafsir. And this is perhaps the easier one for us to understand. And Allah knows which of the two is valid because honestly, both of them have their weight. The second opinion, Ibn Abbas said that the angels themselves did not teach magic. But rather the angels taught mankind of a group of jinn outside of the city of Babylon who would teach them magic if they went there. So the angels taught them the location of the tribe of jinn. And therefore the angels did not sit down and teach them the minutiae of magic. Rather the angels said, look, we are a test from Allah to tell you that there is a place you can learn magic from. And that place is where the jinn reside. And if you go there, you're a kafir. So we are warning you, don't go there. But if you insist, you can go over there and you will become a kafir and you will learn that which will be harmful to you and you will sell yourself to the devil quite literally and you have no share of the hereafter. So the only difference in opinion A and opinion B is what? Did the angels directly teach magic or did they indirectly teach magic? Okay, this is the only difference. In essence though, the angels came down as a test. Whether they directly taught or they indirectly taught. This is very explicit in the Quran. That the angels came down as a test. Harut and Marut were sent down to the city of Babylon. And they were a test to the people of Babylon. And they said to the people of Babylon, we are a fitna, so do not commit kufr. So, by the way, this also shows us that, yes, Allah will test us. Just like He told the Bani Israel, do not work on Saturday. And then what does the Quran tell us? Allah tested a group of the Bani Israel by? By what? By the fish, the fishermen. Allah tested them to see how sincere they were. That after telling them they're not supposed to work on Saturday, so for a number of weeks, the fish would only come on Saturday. This is in the Quran, right? And therefore, the fact that the angels of Harut and Marut are testing mankind, some, somebody will say, why, why, why is this happening? We say, well, because this life is a test. This life is a test. And all of us have easy access to sin living here. All of us. So the fact that sin is accessible is not an excuse. Allah is testing me and you right now by being surrounded by temptations. And Allah tested the people of Babylon with an even bigger temptation than what we have here. And that is actual magic, right? So whether the angels taught directly, whether they taught indirectly, the fact of the matter is that the beginning of magic goes back to Babylon and it goes back to the angels telling them or teaching them the reality of magic. From this verse, we gain many points of benefit. Most importantly for our uh, lecture today, studying magic and practicing magic and believing in magic is all tantamount to kufr. You cannot be a Muslim 
and practice and believe in this. You cannot be a Muslim. And this is very clear in the verse because kufr is mentioned multiple times. Firstly, Allah negates kufr from Sulaiman. وَمَا كَفَرَ Sulaiman. Then he affirms it for the shayateen. For doing what? يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ sihr Because they were teaching mankind magic. So merely teaching sihr makes you a kafir. Right? And then the angels say, we are a fitna, so do not study and become a kafir. فَلَا تَكْفُرْ so studying, so imagine teaching and studying is kufr. How about practicing and believing? Think about it, right? If merely teaching and studying actual sihr becomes kufr, then how about believing and practicing? And therefore, the correct position is that the one who practices and believes in this dark art is not a Muslim in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He might as well be a idol worshiper. He might as well be a uh, a pagan. So this is the second story in the Quran, and that is the story of Sulaiman. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, Sulaiman was not a magician. Sulaiman did not commit kufr. Rather, you want to know where magic started? The shayateen were teaching magic, and the shayateen, it goes back to what Harut and Marut taught to the people of Babylon, whether directly or indirectly. One quick hadith, and then we move on to really the gist of what exactly is magic. Uh, and this hadith brings a lot of issues and problems, but there's also uh, obviously benefits for us, but people are confused by it to the extent many people deny this, but this hadith is mutafaq ali Bukhari and Muslim, and that is that our Prophet himself was the subject of sihr. And that's something that Ahl Sunnah by and large believes, and other groups deny the Mu'tazila deny this, and the progressives deny this, and many people in our times deny this, but we are a people of tradition, Ahl al-Athar, and we believe if the textbooks say it, and the Isnad is authentic, we believe it. So there are numerous narrations in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim that our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Sihr was done against him. And Aisha narrates that Sihr was done on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he began to imagine that he had done something when he hadn't done it. Now, this is Aisha being very diplomatic and appropriate and etiquette. And we learned from other books what was the issue. And the issue was that the Prophet would wake up in the morning believing that he needed to do a ghusl. Means he was intimate, but he had not been intimate. So, shayateen especially love to play with this area of sexuality. And by the way, there's a side point as a tangent here. That's why uh, dreams of a sexual nature, whether a man or a woman sees them, what we call wet dreams, whether ejaculation occurs or not, but all dreams of a sexual nature, all of them emanate from shaitan. And that is why the prophets, none of them can have these types of dreams. The prophets cannot have these dreams. So dreams of that nature, they come from shaitan. Shaitan plays with our minds, men and women, plays with our minds. Now, of course, it's not sinful. We are not held accountable for what we dream and what happens in our sleep, but this is Shaitan playing with our uh, minds. So in this case, our Prophet ﷺ didn't have a dream, but he thought that he had done something natural and allowed between a husband and wife. And Aisha would tell him, no, there's no need for you. And so this was the maximum effect of the sihr. The sihr did not go beyond this. It did not affect the wahi. It did not affect his religion. It did not affect the channels of communication between him and Allah. All that it could affect. And it was the most powerful sahir alive at the time. His name is Labid ibn al-A'asam. We'll come to it. That the max he could do was to make the process and assume he had done something halal. And he hadn't done that halal thing, right? Now, had that sihr been done against another human, it might have killed him. But our Prophet ﷺ, the effect was so minimal that he assumed he had done something that was halal and he hadn't done something that was halal even if he did it, right? You understand? That was the max effect of sihr. So even the effects of sihr were not haram. The imagination that he had was halal. And that's the key point here that the people say, how could the Prophet uh, be mas'hur sihr? Well, read and understand that subhanAllah, the max impact that he had was that he imagined or he thought he had done something halal. And that's halal for a man and a wife to do. So, Aisha says that he made dua to Allah and he made dua and he made dua to Allah. Then he said to me, he's speaking to Aisha, that I feel that Allah has 
inspired me how to cure myself because I saw a dream that two angels came, two people or two angels came and one of them sat at my head and the other sat at my feet and the two began having a conversation. So the first said, what is the problem of this man? The second res responded, he has been mas'hur. Sihr has been done on him. The first said, who has done the sihr? The second said, Labid ibn al-A'asam. Pause here. Labid ibn al-A'asam was the sahir of Medina. He was the most powerful sahir that everybody would come to. And he was uh, one of the Yehudi tribes of Medina. And he was well known for his uh, sihr. So the first one said, how did he do it? What material did he use? The other one replied, he used a comb and the hair that had been gathered on the comb and the outer skin of the pollen of the male date palm. This is one word in Arabic, but we don't have an English equivalent. So there's a male organ of the date palm. There's a shell. And so he put some type of sihr inside this uh, shell. The first one said, where is the sihr? And the second one said, it is in the well of Darwan. It is in the well of Darwan. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to the place of Darwan and he returned and he said to Aisha, the date palms of this well, they look like the heads of devils. And the water of the well is dark bloody. It's not a water, if you look at it, you'll be disgusted, reddish and, and dark water. And uh, Aisha said that, did you take out that magic with which the sihr was done? And the Prophet ﷺ responded in one narration, No, for Allah has cured me of that. And I am I'm afraid that if I take it out, it might cause more harm if the people see it and whatnot. And so the well was ordered to be destroyed and uh, covered up. So we learn many things from this narration. First and foremost, that Iman and Taqwa in and of itself does not necessarily 100% protect you from sihr. Rather, it can minimize the effects of sihr. So, someone like the Prophet ﷺ, how can we possibly, and he is the symbol of Iman. Nobody can even come close to him. And yet, for a wisdom that Allah knows, he allowed our Prophet ﷺ to feel the effects of sihr. So, this shows us that Iman and Taqwa, in and of themselves, might not be a 100% effective mechanism to protect you from sihr. However, they definitely minimize the impact of the sihr. So the general rule, the more iman you have, the less the impact of the sihr on you. Your iman acts like a barrier between you and the sihr. And the stronger your iman, the less the impact of the sihr. And in the case of our Prophet ﷺ, we clearly see this. What was the impact of sihr? The max was that he woke up thinking something halal had happened, right? How is that in and of itself problem? It's just bothersome at the most trivial level, isn't it, right? There's no physical pain, there's no ailment, there's no haram imagination. For our process, it's literally just like the most trivial irritation that I have to take a ghusl. Aisha says, no, we don't have to take ghusl. Why are you thinking this? And, the, and that was because of the uh, sihr. We also learn from this narration that most magic occurs by using some type of body parts of the one upon whom the magic is done. And of course, to use a body part, you're not going to cut something off. So the most common things used are hair and nails. This is the most common thing, you hair and nails and also clothing items. These are typically used, but not necessarily. You can do sihr without them. But typically these things are uh, used. We also learn that one of the main ways to combat sihr is through dua to Allah. Because Aisha says he kept on making dua, he kept on making dua. Fada'a thumma da'a thumma da'a. So one of the main ways to combat sihr is through dua. We also learn from this that it is very helpful to know where the item is. Because the angel told him the item is in the well. And Aisha said, why didn't you get the well out and destroy it? Which means for most of us, it would be very beneficial to get to the item and destroy it. And we also learn it's not necessary to destroy, to eliminate the sihr. Because our Prophet did not, according to one narration, eliminate it. Rather, he said, Allah has cured me from it and he covered up the well 
and uh, uh, basically uh, made it to be the, the, the whole area was demolished. According to another hadith, the angels recited Surah Falaq and Surah Nas. And according to another narration, Surah Falaq and Surah Nas were revealed because of this occasion. So, we learn therefore that Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas are of the most powerful cures for sihr. And both Falaq and Nas basically directly or indirectly talk about sihr. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقْ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ وَمِنْ شَرِّ غَاسْتِقْ نِذَا وَقَبْ وَمِنْ شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدِ I seek refuge in Allah from the evil of those women who are blowing on knots. شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدِ نَفَّاث is, نفاثات is the females that are blowing. And uqad is knots. And this is what they would do. One of the types of sihr is to take some hair, to take some item and tie some knots and then do your incantations, do your, you know, I mean, similar to voodoo dolls in our times, right? You throw a pin in and you do this. So all of this is types of sihr. And Allah says, I seek refuge in you from the evil of those that are doing sihr. And قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ إِلَّهِ النَّاسِ مِنْ شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاسِ أَلَّذِي وَسُفِي سُدُونَ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ General seeking refuge in Allah from the jinn. And the jinn are the cause of sihr. So, we talked about three stories. Musa, Sulaiman, and the Prophet ﷺ. From this, we learn that sihr is a reality. You cannot deny it. It's very clear in the Quran and Sunnah. Explicit. And... Therefore, the question arises, what exactly is sihr? All of this was somewhat of an introduction because I wanted to prove to you that nobody can deny sihr if you believe in the Quran and Sunnah. What exactly is sihr? Well, before we get to what is sihr, let us say what it is not. When I say magic, when I say sihr, we are not talking about the tricks that entertainers do of our times. The types of trickery that entertainers do on the street or on television and they call themselves magicians, this is not the sihr that we are talking about. That entertainment deals with illusions, optical illusions, sleight of hand that he'll convince you that a ball is in his hand, in reality he's already put it in the other hand. And he does this and that and you think it's in this hand, lo and behold, he pulls it out of the other one, right? Basically, the type of magic that we see on television, which is entertainment, pulling rabbits out of hats and sawing people in half and whatnot, this has nothing to do with actual sihr. A real sahir is not an entertainer on television, even if he wants to appear like this. A real sahir is not somebody that's going to be doing these tricks of trades and magic cards and whatnot. This is not sihr. By and large, this is nothing to do. This is illusion, sleight of hand, misdirection, modern technology. A lot of these magicians are using state-of-the-art technology even nowadays. And even, for example, Harry Houdini of the 100 years ago was using technology of his era that we now think is pretty backward. But for his era, he's using state-of-the-art stuff, right? Similarly, the magicians of our times are using state-of-the-art uh, you know, technology to make it appear something that you do not understand. And also, I mean, a lot of them are mass deception, i.e., you know, you see things on television and the reality is, this is well known, the audience is staged. They're paid or they're volunteers or whatever and, you know, the plane disappears and the audience is gasping, oh wow. Well, the audience is in on the act basically and it's entertainment for us watching on ABC, NBC. This is not real sihr. Real sihr does not occur as entertainment. So, that sihr has nothing to do with Fir'aun and the story of Musa and uh, Labid ibn al-A'asam. That's not what we're talking about. Now, some of our scholars are very strict and they say all of that is haram. And I understand uh, and, and definitely it's you know not something that we want to encourage. But at the same time, I don't think that that is haram. And our children like to see these acts and they know our children even at a young age know when the rabbit is pulled out of the hat, there's some type of illusion. I don't understand how it's just cute to look at, right? In my humble opinion, and I know a lot of greater ulama, far more knowledgeable than me have said it is haram, but you know, realistically living in the society, we're surrounded by these magicians, that is not haram. That is just entertainment. It's, whether it's encouraged, no, it's not encouraged. And I wouldn't encourage our young men and women to get involved. But it's not a stepping stone to devil worship. Let's be real here, 
right? If you get a magic set on Amazon.com and you, you know, it gives you these tricks and whatnot, it doesn't tell you how to worship the devil. You have trick cubes and trick boxes and you know, you know what I'm talking about here, right? That is simple child's play. And no doubt our children should be interested in more serious things, but that's not haram. It's just entertainment and, and, and whatnot. Um, so then what type of sihr are we talking about? We are talking about sihr that is in our vernacular called black magic or the dark arts. That in our vernacular is called, this is the dark arts. And the type of sihr that the Quran talks about is the sihr that deals with the jinn. That is the type of sihr that of course has been uh, prohibited. So, for those who came late, uh, I said that we had already talked about the reality of the jinn. I'm not going to go over all of the details of that, but just a quick refresher. If we understand the reality of the jinn, we will understand the reality of magic. So when I say magic from now on, we're not talking about the fake magic. I call that, you know, entertainment magic. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about actual sihr. So if we understand the reality of the jinn, we will understand the reality of sihr because you cannot have sihr without the jinn. The jinn intrinsically go with sihr. There's no such thing as sihr without jinn. Clear? Every sihr has to have jinn involved because in the end of the day, how does something happen? The magician has no power. That's why Musa accused them, you're frauds. You don't have any power and you know that. You're lying. The magician pretends that he has power. In reality, the power of the magician is nothing other than the physical, natural services of the jinn. So if we understand what the jinn are naturally capable of, and we understand that the jinn have for some reason, what that reason is we'll talk about now, agreed to help the magician, we will understand that Magic is nothing other than what the jinns are naturally capable of doing. There's no supernatural, there's no mystical, there's no semi-divine. The jinns are not all powerful. Rather, Allah has given them strengths that He has not given us. And He has given us strengths that He has not given them. So when the magician utilizes the strengths of the jinn, we don't have to be astonished and amazed and say, Oh my God, how did He do that? Rather, just like we can see a man galloping on a horse at MashaAllah Tabarakallah. How fast does a horse gallop? I have no idea. 40 miles an hour? I don't know. 40, 50 miles an hour, right? Now, imagine if we saw the man galloping on a horse, right? Would we say, MashaAllah, how did he do? We know a horse goes 50 miles an hour. What's the big deal? Correct? Now, imagine if we couldn't see the horse and we saw the man going that fast. <laughs> we would be pretty freaked out, right? But once we understand that it's just the jinn doing it, nothing supernatural. Now, when I say nothing supernatural, for the jinn, it's not supernatural. For us, from our world, it's supernatural. For our world, but not for the jinn. For the jinn, it's totally natural. And so if we understand the physical and psychological nature of the jinn, we will understand magic completely. And wallahi, we will not fear it anymore. Because it is ignorance that causes us to fear this. We will not fear it at all, any more than we fear a predator. Yes, if we see a snake, I will be scared. But that's a natural fear, okay? So if we discover magic, we should also, some of us might feel a natural fear. But there should not be a fear of the unknown or unknown. It's just that it's bewildering for us because we cannot see the jinn. We cannot see it. That's why it throws everything into confusion. If we could see the jinn, we would fear it like we fear a beast, like we fear a, a, a predator, like we fear, but because we cannot, our fear becomes mystical. And sometimes even borders on shirk or beyond what it should be, and that's a problem. So quickly again, we've done this in a lot of detail in the previous lecture, which is the reality of the jinn. What are some of the character, the physical characteristics of the jinn? What are the jinn made of? What type of fire? Smokeless fire. Go back to my lecture. What did I theorize? What are the jinn made of? Energy. My humble hypothesis is energy. Take it or leave it as not based on the Quran and Sunnah. It's just my, in, in light of modern science, 
there is this intuition that I personally believe. And the more I study and the more I read, the more this is personally I believe this. But again, this is not Quran and Sunnah. They're a type of energy. A type of energy. So if they're a type of energy, how fast can they go? Quite literally, the speed of light. Quite literally. Quite literally, they travel at the speed of light, right? If they're energy, then do physical structures block them? No. Just like my phone is working right now and we're inside the room, right? Just like radio waves, just like other waves are coming into this room and the, the physical structure has nothing to do with them. It's nothing. It just, the, the, it, they're not body. And this also, by the way, I talked about this. A lot of people say, what is the original form of the jinn? Well, who told you they have an original form? Who told you that? They don't, most likely, they don't have an original form. There is no such thing as an original form for that which doesn't have a shape. They don't have any. So they can, they're shapeshifters, huh? they love the modern uh, science fiction guy. They can change shape because that's a part of their nature. That Allah created them so that they can accommodate. They're not a particular uh, body. So they have... Uh, they're made out of smokeless fire, so this makes them invisible to us, right? And this also, so they have the, the, the capacity to, and, and this is, we know this from the, the Quran and Sunnah, we also know this from uh, our own experiences, they have the capacity to transfer uh, from one energy to another, I'm using my vernacular, so they can become uh, physical and they can be seen to us when they want to. So how do they do that in our modern vernacular? They'll simply shift into the color spectrum of light waves. Because for us, what's the only energy we can sense and feel? It's a very, very small window. This is physics, by the way, are the physics guys here. What is the only energy that we can, we can uh, see, I should say? It's a very small window, and that's red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, violet, uh, um, green, blue, indigo, violet, the, the, the colors of the spectrum, right? So. The, the jinn have the capacity to just move their energy into that level, if you like. And they can then appear to us. They have the capacity to project their voice so that we can hear the energy of the sound. But it's all energy. It's all, that's a part of who they can, they can be. Uh, so they are invisible. And Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ Iblis and his tribe can see you from places you cannot see them. So in this regard, they have the upper hand. They can see you and you cannot see them. They can make their presence known to you. You don't have any clue when, where they are or not. Okay. Uh, also, we learn uh, that the jinn, generally speaking, are more stronger than men physically. This doesn't mean they have infinite power. Only Allah has that power. It just means that an average jinn is physically stronger than an average man. Just like an average man is physically stronger than an average woman. That's all it is. Therefore, some jinns are weaker than average people. Some jinns are weaker than a child. But average strength of a jinn is stronger than the average strength of a man. This doesn't mean they're all powerful. This means maybe you need three, four, five people to hold a jinn down if they're in a body, let's say. Doesn't mean that they're all powerful, right? Only Allah Azza wa Jal is. Also, once you understand, again, your fear becomes natural rather than uh, supernatural. And uh, another thing that we learned from the story of uh, Sulaiman and Sheba, uh, Bilqis, the queen of Sheba, Another thing that we learn is that the jinn have a very unique power, which is truly bizarre. And physicists who are Muslims should really marvel at this. Uh, and that is the power to transform matter into energy and back into matter again. And that's something that we are trying to figure out how to do. E equals mc squared. Energy and matter are related. We know this. Uh, and the jinn have the power to do this. How do we know this? The throne. The throne of Bilqis, or the queen of Sheba, the throne that from Yemen to Jerusalem, قَالَ عِفْرِيتٌ مِّنَ الْجِنْ Now, jinns, we talked about this in the last class, there are many levels, and Ifrit are the most evil and the most powerful. Ifrit are the, what Western literature calls demons of the jinn. These are the worst of the worst. So 
the Ifrit said, I can bring you the throne before you even stand up. Which makes total sense, physically speaking, from physics, I mean. If the jinn can go and come back at the speed of light, and this one jinn is so powerful. And now, again, this is my two cents, and I said this in the other class. It is as if Allah is saying, this is the max that any jinn can possibly do. Because Sulaiman had control over all the jinns. And one of them said, just one, which means the rest, they don't have that power, right? So we need to put things into perspective that the jinns are not all of them so powerful. We have some, there's a lot of noise in the back if we can, huh? If we can just, <laughs> it's like, uh, those who want to, uh, the children, they can go outside. But if you can have the children, maybe go to the other uh, room. Uh, so the fact that one only said, that he can do this, clearly shows what? That the rest are not qualified to do it. And that that was the strongest and the best. So therefore we need to understand that what is the strength of the strongest jinn that maybe we have ever seen? He can pick up the throne of Sheba. Okay, in these days a crane can do that. I'm just saying, right? It's not as if the jinn can pick a star up or the moon. You see what I'm saying? It's a physical strength that we can understand. And what was miraculous, or not, I should say, mirac what was supernatural for us was what? Is that to transport it. And it is well known that this throne is going to be inside the palace. That when, if he were to take the throne, it would not be flying in the air. People are not going to see it flying. Rather, it would disappear there and appear in front of Suleiman, which means what? E equals MC squared here, right? Einstein was probably right in this regard. So it's a, a beam me up, beam me up, Scotty, right? This is what, it, and it, and this is what we believe if we believe in the story that it is possible. Whether we will ever have that power, I would say never. I don't think. So. But what do we learn from this? Somehow the jinn have that power. Somehow the jinn have the power to take matter, transform it to energy, take it all the way back, and then reproduce it. Right? And by the way, this is something that is well known mutawatir from the stories of what's happening and, and, and whatnot, that it is possible for a magician to just produce an item that was lost, literally, and it goes, here it is, right? Or looking into crystal balls and whatnot that we see, that you see things in there. And these are the jinns that you see playing around and whatnot. You know, so all of this, it is possible. And we know this from our own experiences uh, in humanity. So. So therefore, what is magic? Magic is the magician, magic is the magician getting the jinn to do his tricks. What are the tricks? What would the jinn have the, the, what would the magician have the jinn do? So whatever the magician is paid to do, whatever the magician is paid, somebody will come to the magician and say, I want this man's business to go bad. I want their marriage to fail. I want them to have no children. This is, this is the common reasons, right? And so the magician will get the jinn. I'll get to how he'll get it. The magician will get the jinn to go and do things. What will the jinn do? Whatever the jinn does is something we now understand is physical and natural for the jinn. For the jinn, not for us, for the jinn. So what's going to happen? Well, uh, the people are not going to come to his business. Why wouldn't people come to his business? For so, If somebody walks by the business, they will hear some waswas or saying, don't go there, whatever. So these are waswas the jinn is putting in, right? Or some physical calamities can happen that are inex inexplicable. That a man is just walking and all of a sudden, you know, the, the owner of the business, the one that sihr was done, he just slips, a really bad slip. You ask him, how could you slip in the middle of the day? There was no, I, I don't know, I just put my foot. In other words, the jinn's physically pushing him. Right? And multiple slips. It's like, I don't know what's happening because he doesn't understand what's happening. Multiple times that, it, now we're not talking about, a, a, here's the point I'm going to come to and jumping the gun. If you can understand why things are happening, classical cartoon story, if there's a banana right there and you slip on the banana, there's no magician, there's no sihr. Okay? I'm being stereotypical here, but you get the point here. If you see a physical cause, and you trip on a fit or something, then no. If you have a bad product and nobody's buying it, this is not sihr, okay? <laughs> this is not sihr, okay? 
Rather, if it's inexplicable, and I'm going to come to how do we know if it's sihr or not, that multiple times things are happening. And again, the uh, standard example is uh, not having children, that uh, miscarriages all the time, all the time miscarriages, one after the other. And the doctors are scratching their heads. I don't understand. You're normal. You're normal. The two of you are normal. The, the, we, we did the test. Everything is normal. One after the other. And of course, it could be physical because the jinn could quite literally, I mean, I don't know you know, how. I'm not a biologist, but I'm sure doctors can say if you can squeeze, I don't know, so the, the, the fetus or whatever, some type of physical thing the jinn can do. Right Now, if the doctors say, oh, we see the problem there. If the doctor can see it and analyze it, it cannot be sihr. If it's a problem in the genes, in the DNA, if it's a problem that of hormones, if it's a problem of the male or the female, and the doctor has a diagnosable problem, this is not sihr. Because by its nature and definition, sihr is, what does sihr mean? Hidden, you don't understand it. Right? Any time the cause is clear and physical, it's not sihr. So if the doctor says, you know, I'm sorry, but you have a hormonal issue, you have too much of this, too much of that, or too little of this, this is clearly not sihr. But if the doctors are scratching their head, or, you know, pains or bruises or whatnot, and the doctor's like, I don't know, we don't know what's going on. This is a disease that is beyond anything. And every doctor specialist you go to, they just don't understand what is happening here. So this is what we would call a type of sihr. But from the jinn's perspective, the jinn is not doing anything. The jinn is basically not saying kun fayakun. Only Allah has that power. The jinn does not have what we would call genuine supernatural power or divine power. Is that clear? That's what I want to get across to you. Whatever the jinn is doing, the jinn has the power to do physically. Because the jinn can enter the body and the jinn has access to the blood. As we know, the Prophet said the jinn runs in the blood, right? And the jinn has other powers we might not know about. But it's physical for the jinn and not supernatural. So, all sihr is basically jinns doing their tricks. Clear? Now, the next question. We understand then what sihr is, and that's the jinn doing its tricks. The question therefore is, why would the jinn do it? Why would he do it? We understand what's going on. But the question is, why would he do it? And this is where I'm going to destroy one of the most incorrect myths about black magic that is absolutely dead wrong. And we need to get this out of our minds completely. The, the myth is that the magician controls the jinn. This is a myth. This is a lie. This is completely wrong. The myth is that the magician is powerful and the magician has somehow trapped the jinn, has somehow made the jinn his servant. And so the magician portrays himself. And of course, why is this myth popular? Because that's what the magicians say. That's what the magicians want to point out, that we are the ones in control. In reality, nothing could be further from the truth. Rather, listen to this, the magician is a servant of the jinn. And the magician is a worshiper and humbling himself in front of the jinn. The jinn is lord and master of the magician. The other way around. Now, of course, the magician doesn't want to tell you that. And that's why he portrays himself as the master. But the fact of the matter is the opposite is true. And therefore, whatever the jinn does, it does because it wants to do it. Not because the master has, or sorry, the magician has forced him. Here's a key point we believe. No one could control the jinn other than Suleiman. To claim that a sahir controls the jinn, you are saying the sahir has the same power that Suleiman did. And that's what Allah is saying. وَمَا كَفَرَ Sulaiman. Suleiman's control of the jinn was not through magic. Allah gave him that power. And the shayateen said, Suleiman controls us through magic as well, to smear him, to smear him. And Allah says, وَمَا كَفَرَ Sulaiman." Sulaiman did not control the jinn through magic. So anybody who says that the magician controls the jinn is accusing or saying that the magician has the same power as Sulaiman, and that's dead wrong. So why then would the 
jinn do something for the magician. Here is where we get to the key point of magic that sihr is a bartering, a transaction between the magician and the jinn. Sihr is a business transaction, literally. It's like you go to a shop, you give money and you purchase something, right? It's a business deal. And the magician gives something to the jinn and the jinn gives something back to the magician. And the both of them need each other, but the more powerful of the two is the jinn and not the magician. Just like we need each other in business transactions, right? I need to go to your restaurant, your car shop, your this. You need my money, I need your services. This is the reality. We need each other. And in most of our transactions, there's an equal amount of element. We all need each other. That's how society functions. But in sihr, there is not an equal. In sihr, the more powerful is the jinn. And the less powerful by far is the magician. So the magician gives something to the jinn. Now, obviously, what does the jinn want? The jinn does not want your American Express number. I'll take it, but not the magician. You can give it to me. No problem. As long as the expiration date is there too. No problem. I'll take it. Right? But the jinn doesn't need your American Express. Doesn't need your cash. Doesn't need your credit. What does the jinn need? Doesn't even need your food. What does it need? The jinn, what was the fundamental problem of Iblis when Adam was created? He felt he was overlooked. I am better than you. Ana khayrun minhu. So the jinn feel inferior. We can quite literally say, Sihr comes from an inferiority complex of the jinn. Quite literally we can say this. The jinn feel inferior. Because they know we are better. Now hold on a sec. How could we be better when all of these things have been given to the jinn and not to us? Because Allah gave us the most powerful thing He didn't give to the jinn and that is Aql. Knowledge and intelligence. We are more knowledgeable and more intelligent than the jinn. And knowledge is power. And that's why even in our society, what do we value more? The intellect or the strong man? Who gets paid the most? The CEO or the wrestler? Well, these days, okay. Even, even if you want to say the wrestler for a while, how long is he going to get paid? For what? The boxer, how long is he going to get paid, right? In reality, okay, let's, let me put it this way. Who gets paid more? Uh, the office worker or the manual labor? Let me put it that way, right? Even though who does more physical work? Obviously. I mean, you can hire somebody at minimum wage to do the most grueling labor in the sun, to build and to carry and to whatnot, and you pay him what? What is minimum wage these days? Eight dollars an hour, seven dollars an hour, right? Seven twenty-five is it in Tennessee? Huh? Seven eighty-five, right? When I started, it was four ten or something. Subhanallah. You guys are lucky, man. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so, oh, when he started, it's a dollar sixty. So, <laughs> that's true, actually. Alhamdulillah. I was lucky when I started. So the point being that you will find somebody to do that manual labor, and what do you pay a lawyer? <laughs> Three hundred fifty. What do you pay the doctors? I don't want to insult you guys. What do you pay with doctors, man? You know what I'm saying? Like Subhanallah, right? So. And you guys are sitting in your office looking at, anyway, let me not go too far. The point being that, <laughs> who gets paid more? It's the intellect. It's the people of intellect, not power, right? So in the end of the day, Allah gave us what He didn't give the jinn. We are smarter than the jinn. And we have knowledge and the jinn don't have that knowledge. And we have prophets amongst us and the books are revealed to us and so on and so forth. So the jinn always feel inferior. So what do they want from man? They want to feel superior. They want to feel we're the boss. So what do they do? They, they trade. Just like the manual labor will give you his sweat because, hey, I don't have the power he has. I don't have the power. I'm not going to build bricks and whatnot. You have that power. You have the time. I'll pay you. I have money. So what does the jinn have? The physical power. He has the speed. He has the, the, the hiddenness. He can transfer knowledge. He can do this and that. He's giving you his manual labor. What are you going to pay him back? Your devotion, your dedication, your worship, your subservience. You will literally, literally prostrate yourself 
and bend over backwards and do whatever the jinn wants and humiliate yourself to please the jinn. And that's why, and of course, that's one reason the jinn do it. And of course, another reason is that. So number one, it makes them feel. And number two, misguidance. Because the jinns know when you're going to worship them other than Allah, well then, takes you out of Islam. Khalas, they won. Right? Because one of the goals of the jinn is what? Misguidance. They want to misguide you. So, the jinn tells the magician, you want my services? This is my price. And what does he ask him to do? I don't want to tell you too much detail and alhamdulillah I haven't studied it in too much now, nor should I, but you know the horror movies that all of us see and whatnot. The fact of the matter is, is elements of truth that humanity has learned and they put it into these horror movies. There's some things that they know and we know this from our culture. So what does the magician do? Sacrilegious things, right? Things that are just disgusting evil blood sacrifice right or you know even in children's books so what is the magic recipe made of what is something that you put in the magic potion right toads the grass says toads huh bones okay the eye of a what not and the 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 leg of a this and that now ima and you know we laugh at this there's an element of truth here meaning what imagine if you have a list as ridiculous as this Get the bone of a dog, get the eye of a this, get that. And you have to go around for days getting these things. How do you think the jinn is going to feel watching you in humiliation? This is giving the jinn what? A boost, a thrill, right? And then he will say, go to the graveyard in the middle of the night and do this and do that. So the magician will go along and do it all. So in reality, who's more in charge? The jinn is more in charge, not the magician. Because the magician, I mean... In reality, the magician needs the jinn more than the jinn needs the magician. So the magician will literally sell himself to the jinn. And when you sell yourself to the jinn, you cannot be a worshiper of Allah. You cannot be a worshiper of Allah. And that is why it is very common for the, for the magician to actually do acts of blatant kufr. Things that are absolutely disgusting. Things that involve, and I don't want to even mention it inside the masjid, but it involves dishonoring some of the signs of Allah. It involves najis, it involves humiliating his own body. It involves yani, sacrilegious, vulgar, profane. And I don't want to give examples, but wallahi, the worst of the worst things that even, even a, a, a person who is bad will not do what the magician does, right? You will have thieves, you will have murderers, you will have, they have a, a limit of what they, how they maintain themselves. Magicians have no depths of depravity that they're not going to go down to. Doing stuff that even an agnostic atheist would feel disgusted at doing. And I do not want to give any examples, but anything you can think of, wallahi, they do worse than that. I swear by Allah, they do worse than that. And I speak from my own experiences with doing exorcisms and whatnot, that they do much worse than this. And though anything you can think of, they do worse than this. And why do they do it? Because again, from the perspective of the jinn, it's getting a thrill looking at you, humiliating yourself, putting najis on yourself, eating this, doing that, going there. Look at the thrill that you're giving the jinn, right? And so in return, if the jinn just has to go and slap somebody and come back, more than happy to do it so that you have to grovel even more, right? Correct, right? And this is the reality of what sihr is, that the magician is basically giving this jinn some boost and misguiding himself by becoming uh, away from Islam or worshiping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Literally, I mean, with the, they say that you sell yourself to the devil. That's literally what you do. Literally, it's not, even a, uh, it's not even a figure of speech here. That's what you do is you sell yourself to the shaitan. Do what you want or ask me to do what you want and I will then, you know, obey you. Now, therefore, what therefore happens here is that what happens is that, uh, and, and okay, so why would, the, why would the magician do this before I move on to the next one? Why would the magician want to do that? What is the motivation of the magician? Money. Money. And maybe even fame, but money. The main motivation of the magician is money. And what did the 
Fir'aun's magicians say, قَالُوا أَإِنَّ لَنَا لَأَجْرًا What's in it for us? Right? So, magicians, what do they gain? Money. From whom? From people that come to them. It's a profession. It's a job. And a job that gives them power as well. That's another thing. It makes them feel powerful above other men, but not above the jinn, because they are the servant of the jinn, right? They have to humiliate themselves in front of the jinn, but in front of the other people, it makes them feel. It's like, imagine how a massive bodybuilder would feel, though nobody can beat me up, right? Walking around like that. That type of boost, I got the jinn that's going to help me. This is arrogance, correct? That arrogance will be given to the magician, no doubt about it, because he feels he has a weapon that you cannot oppose. But what does Allah say? They can never harm somebody except with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to then summarize very briefly, so then what exactly is, uh, how does this happen? That the man who wants to do this evil deed, the man or woman who wants to do this evil deed to become a magician, so they learn and study this art from somebody who's already trained. And this person will tell him, you need to do this and this and this. And again, this is filtered down through our horror movies as well. There's this element of truth. Sit at 3 a.m. facing such a direction in the middle of a pentagon and you draw it out and you will have this color light and you will have this and that. So these are signals being given to the jinn world that I'm willing to enter. So these are, this is re in reality, this is exactly how it happens, right? That these are signals that are being given to the jinn world that this is what the Babylon jinns were taught. That how do you communicate with us? How do you get in touch with us? And from that has been developed as we said into Madai. But the point is, so the magician does this. And he will sit there and sit there and subhanAllah, I've interviewed a number of these people uh, before and after their toba, sometimes before, sometimes after. And yes, this is exactly the, the, the reality that they will say that we did this and you know, every day nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. So the jinn is seeing if you're serious or not until finally one day they see something or a power or a presence or a voice or whatever. And then they are told, do this. So raise it up a notch. Are you serious? Then do this. So then there's direct communication. They will go and do it. And then the relationship begins. The relationship begins. And then this jinn that they contact, typically, uh, and I say this from my own experience, I haven't, uh, I don't know of anything in the Quran and Sunnah that would support this, but nothing negates it as well. From my own experience is what I have found, that the jinn that communicates with the sahir is not typically the jinn that goes and irritates or does the, the, the harm. Rather, that jinn does indeed have minions, servants. Because here's the point, the myth is that the, the, the magician controls the jinn. I've asked people with what? Chains? Whips? How? What are you going to use to control the jinn? How? You can't even see it. How can you control it? But cannot the stronger jinn control the weaker jinn? In their own world? Yes. Because that's their world. And quite literally, quite literally, the jinns are like some type of mafia with the boss, with the godfather at the figurehead, right? And the, the magician contacts one of the upper guys, one of the henchmen, one of the bigger, maybe even the boss himself. And then his work is subcontracted out. Literally. Tells one of the lower guys on the, on the ladder, you have to go do that, right? Minimum wage, outsourcing it, right? Outsourcing it. But no, not to India. No, no, don't worry. No. <laughs> Having said that, there's a lot of it in India and Pakistan. Yes, unfortunately. It's reality, isn't it? Huh? It's a <laughs> uh, the point being that, and this is my own experience that Allah knows best, that, that uh, I don't want to tell too many stories here, but let me just give one or two. In the, so I've asked a number of, of jinns, why are you doing this? Jinns. Yeah, when I'm doing the exorcism. So I've said, when I get to the jinn to talk, a few times, let me just. Uh, so I said, what are you getting out of this? What is it in it for you? And I've got multiple responses. Now, we don't believe necessarily the jinn, but these responses to me seem legitimate at the time because of the circumstances, because of this and that, so I'm not going to go into detail, but I've asked, uh, let me not say I've asked, it has been said 
that a number of them said, so one of them said that if I, if I don't do this, I will be punished by, not, they didn't mention it, by the bigger guys, right? I'll be punished by the, by the, because look, the thing is when you're performing an exorcism and you are reciting Quran, the jinn is being tortured. The jinn is being tortured, right? Uh, and subhanAllah, we're already getting to almost to the end that there's so much left to do. The jinn is being tortured. So in that stage, you know, you ask this jinn, wouldn't you rather just leave rather than be tortured here? I mean, why don't you leave? Because right now you're definitely not enjoying this. So just leave. And so the jinn says, if I leave, I will face that type of torture and I'll be shredded to bits and whatnot. And, and therefore, and one of them even said, I would rather die in this way than what they would do. So whatever it is, I don't know, right? Whatever it is, that's not. In another instance, uh, it said that I do this because, and this was only one time I heard that this, I do this because I am honored when I commit the deed. When I do this, they give me the big guys. They give me a lot of honor. Now, what is that honor? It's not money, but whatever it is. Just like we are motivated by money, for sure the jinn have their internal motivations. Okay? So this is that subcontract thing out, right? That something is given to this entity. Something is given to this entity that makes it feel very, very big. Very, like, I, I'm willing to do this in order to get the promotion, whatever. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a good thing. Promotion or the reward or whatever. Uh, and on one occasion... Uh, the, the entity said that uh, that it's beyond my control that they have bound me physically from whatever that is and I cannot uh, I cannot yeah, stop doing this I, it's like I don't have any choice here because they have physically bound me and I kept on trying to get out how 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 but it wouldn't tell me so the point is and again we don't know if this is true or not we don't base our religion on this but at the same time hearing all of this we see that there are multiple motivations there are motivations that are different. Sometimes it's threat, sometimes it's bribe. And sometimes there seems to be some type of slave labor going on amongst them too. That it's not, I can't help it, it's just, it's just uh, happening. But uh, generally speaking, what we have discovered, all the people who do this, is that generally the jinn that communicates with the magician is not the jinn that actually ends up doing the deed. And of course, one of the things that clarifies this as well is that the quantity of jinn is far more numerous than the quantity of men. Because jinns procreate by the thousands. Every jinn has sired thousands. And each jinn lives for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. So when you have jinns that are by the billions and billions and billions, so for sure it's easier to get, you know, cheap labor basically. Right? Subcontract out and, and get it done. So, uh, so much left, subhanAllah, might have to go down to number four. But let me, uh, so we're going to have to skip over many things. Um, skip over the hadith about magic, the types of magic and uh, astrology and its relation. All of this skipping over. Uh, let's just get to some of the points that we need to really understand. I don't want to, I don't want to delay this to part four. Maybe we'll have another, sorry, part three. Maybe we'll have another part three about those things. Part, uh, let's finish this by talking about how can we detect magic? When do we know if it is actually magic? When do we know if it is actually magic or not? And this is one of the biggest problems that our Muslim community has, that many people, especially our sisters, blame everything on magic. <laughs> Slightest problem, jadu, seher. Ain, Nazar. <laughs> and this is a psychological problem. Wallahi, it's a problem. In my own humble experience, and I'm not somebody who has specialized, I just dabble in, in exorcism or not. In my own humble experience, I would say 95% of the times that people come to me and they think they have some sihr, it is mental sihr. Something is wrong up here. Okay? 95% of the time in my own experience that there's there's just they want to just blame something that like I said the classic example if you're selling food and the biryani is substandard and nobody's buying 
don't blame sihr. You have to increase the taste of the biryani, for example, right? Here's the point. If you are, if you're having problems in your business, in your marriage, and this and that, before you jump to sihr, before you think something is wrong with, you know, supernaturally, realize that, look, there are problems all the time. Do you really think every business is going to be successful? I mean, wallahi, everyone who started a business knows nine out of ten businesses are failures. This is just the rule of thumb, right? Do you think every marriage is going to be successful? Every marriage has its ups and downs. Every couple has its fighting. Even our Prophet Sallallahu he had some issues with his wives. We from the Quran, we know this, right? So every time a couple fights, the wife thinks, oh, this is jadu. I'm so perfect, my husband would never scream at me. <laughs> I'm sorry, sister, but goes two ways, okay? That's the reality. And, and uh, subhanAllah, I mean, this is the problem. This is the problem. So how then do you know if it's actually sihr or not? There are certain symptoms and signs. Now, I'm not even going to talk about the most obvious symptoms and signs because if something is supernatural, you don't need to go through all of these long lists and whatnot, okay? If somebody is flying in the air, then you can pretty much rule out everything else, okay? You know, or if you literally see uh, shaitan, yani literally you see it in the house and it is, or you hear it for example or, or something, then of course, I mean, you, don't, you, know, you rule all of this out. I mean, we're not talking about something that's self-evident, you know, that's, that, that's pretty clear. We're talking about how do you know? So you will always have some symptoms, some symptoms. And the most common symptom is that when ruqya is done, Quran is recited, adhan is heard, then some type of reaction will occur. This is the most common way to detect if sihr has been done. That constant Quranic recitation and constant listening to the adhan should have some type of impact. If it's, and the worse the magic, the more immediate the impact. Okay? The worse the sihr, the more immediate the reaction to the sihr. And the more slight the sihr, the more prolonged. So, and so, the, I mean, again, I had to skip over a lot of stuff, but there are many types of sihr. And there's sihr that's so trivial that you hardly even know it. And it takes weeks even to, to figure out it's there. And then there's sihr that you simply, you know, bring the person in front of the, the one who's doing ruqya and you see it right then and there with your eyes that this person is freaking out. You know, so it's too, without even saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, without even saying anything, the person starts uh, reacting ch just by seeing it because it knows that you're going to recite on it. So it starts going berserk. So the point is, you can tell by Quranic recitation, by uh, adhan and seeing the, the impact. Uh, another uh, way to tell is that, as we said, inexplicable uh, symptoms, i.e. beyond understanding. And that is that, for example, I give you a number of examples, that a person is tripping, and this is something I dealt with multiple times, like he's, mashallah, 30, 40, 50 years, he's not like a two-year-old toddler, and for no reason, he's falling on the stairs, he's falling in the streets, he's falling, and he's like, I don't understand. I mean, I just, and he said, I feel something. So a normal person who's healthy and whatnot is not just going to be slipping and tripping. And then he says, it's as if somebody pushed me. So there is something supernatural, right? Something beyond what you understand. And I also gave the example of, of going to the doctor and the doctors are all scratching their head. Everything seems normal to us. We don't understand why. You know, for example, a pain and uh, and the pain is typically in the stomach or in the head or something. And the doctor's like, we're doing the MRI, we're doing the scanner, we're doing this and that. Nothing is there. So any time the doctor has a diagnosable disease, it cannot be sihr. Because by definition, if it's a diagnosable, so the, the, the jinn does not give cancer. Okay? Cancer is a disease. The jinn does not create microbes or, or, or viruses and throw them in the body. Right? If the doctor can say, oh, he has this virus, there's no jinn involved. Okay? So... For a jinn to be there, for sihr to be there, has to be something above and beyond our regular realm. And many of us and some of you doctors have also dealt with these cases where the doctors just don't understand why this is happening. Um, also, uh, especially when it comes to marriage, because the most common type of sihr is breaking up a marriage. The most common type of sihr is breaking up a marriage. And this is by the testimony of the Quran. Yufarriquna bihi baynal. 
Mar'i wa zawji. So, uh, couples having intimacy problems that doctors just don't seem to understand why. That you seem normal, uh, you know, the arousal is normal, let's say, in the man, only except when he wants to come uh, to his wife, then all of a sudden uh, he feels weird or he feels a headache or a lot of times there's a physical push, like literally a push back and there's nothing you can see there. So these are all supernatural symptoms that uh, that the doctor is like, you're nothing wrong with you. But for some reason, there's there's, or also another sign is that anger or depression that is extreme and was not common before a certain incident. Now, some people have bad tempers. If they've had bad tempers their whole lives, there's no sihr. Okay? But some people are, mashallah, are very calm, very good. Then instantaneously, they just flip. And for the last year or two years, they seem to be a different person. Now, this is very common. If you hear somebody say, he seems to be a different person for the last, you know, we went to our home country. This is very common. We went to our home country ever since we came back. He seems to be a different person. This now warning bells go off in my head when I hear this. Okay, that this is not the regular habit of this man. As we said, some people have temperaments. So if a person is known to be of evil temperament, okay, that's the way some people are. But if somebody has a change that is overnight and it must be instantaneous because sihr is always instantaneous, right? Uh, that extreme depression, extreme anger, and these are the two main symptoms uh, in terms of psychological, then we can diagnose further and read Quran and see what is happening. Another, another sign of sihr is unnatural aversion to a specific person or place uh, that would not typically have been there. Okay, And again, if sihr is done between two people, if sihr is done between two people, so let's say a marriage was mediocre, right? Most marriages are okay, good, alhamdulillah. Instantaneously, the wife notices that my husband is never, ever nice to me, around me, wants to be away from me, whereas he wasn't like this for 10 years of the marriage. And always in a bad mood, always angry, always cursing. And yet, he seems to be normal, not in my vicinity. Now, if this is an instantaneous change, because let's be honest here, sometimes a husband does not like his wife, and then things go sour, they go down south, okay? But we are talking about an instantaneous change, that's the key point here, that everything seemed to be normal, then somebody visited, or we went somewhere, or that, and now the two of them are not getting along. And again, it seems unnatural, like the wife saying, I didn't do anything, or it could be the other way, the husband saying, I didn't do anything, and my wife is just, uh, for some reason now, for years now, for months now, and again, one incident, don't think of sihr, one incident is everybody's marriage, right? We're talking about a continuous stream that never has an exception, i.e. always there's going to be a problem, for months and months and months. Then one can think about, and also, by the way, there's always going to be other symptoms, always. Of those symptoms also as well is change in sleeping habits or eating habits. Again, this is a sudden change. So for example, he used to like heavy foods and all of a sudden he doesn't want to eat rice or, or, or meat and he only wants to eat, you know, let's say vegetables, let's say, right? That would be a big change for me, for example, okay? <laughs> all of a sudden, give up all meat, la hawla khusla billah, right? And just become a strict, you know, vegan, vegan yes. Without any reason, not that if he's talking about, I want to lose weight, I want to go, obviously we understand. Again, we're talking about inexplicable, okay? One case that I dealt with that, uh, the person would literally have one meal a day of just leaves and, and broccoli and that's it. Whereas before this was a young man, he would be eating like young men, three full meals. Whereas instantaneously, the mother's saying like, whatever food I give him, it comes back untouched. Unt he doesn't want to eat anything. And staying the night awake and going to sleep right before Fajr is another sign as well. That you cannot sleep at night. Tossing and turning at night and then right before Fajr, dead out for the most of the day. Because the shayateen go to sleep before Fajr. The shayateen go to sleep before Fajr and they are active and awake at night. So a person who's always, he used to have a regular sleeping habit, then all of a sudden, and again, it must be instantaneous. If there's 
a change in habit, obviously that's natural, but an instantaneous change in habit. Uh, so again, these are all symptoms and typically there's multiple. Rarely do you come across only one. Typically there's multiple of these symptoms. Uh, one of the most important symptoms is dreams. Dreams. It is rare, very, very rare to meet a person that has sihr who doesn't have bizarre dreams. This is one of the biggest warning signs. When I hear it, one of the first questions I ask is, what are your dreams? Tell me about your dreams. The ones that are the most awkward, the most embarrassing, the most vivid, you're not supposed to tell publicly, but tell me because I need to diagnose you as a, as a person who's doing it. So you hear the most vulgar or the most bizarre or the most frightening and especially, and I say this, uh, so here's another point. We need to differentiate between our, between our imagination and between reality. So when I say this and all of a sudden tonight you have this dream, then this is your, your imagination. Okay? So I'm being very blunt here. Uh, to feel as if there's a pressure on your chest and you can't breathe at night. To see yourself being attacked by snakes, scorpions, black dogs, lions, to feel asphyxiated, to feel a presence, you know the sixth sense that they say, to feel a presence that I can feel there's somebody here and there's nobody there. These are all symptoms that are pretty common uh, when it comes to sihr. And again, typically there's more than one of these uh, symptoms that takes place. If you don't have any of these symptoms and you're just having a bad business luck or bad streak of marriage, don't think of sihr, think of improving the marriage by making the biryani better. I don't know, I mean something, you know, something's got to be done. But uh, <laughs> let's not go that far. Um, the problem comes that we, many of us want an easy solution. Oh, somebody else did it. No, all of us have our issues, our ups and downs, our businesses, our children, all of us. Unless you see some clear symptoms that are just on this list and you just don't understand, right? Then do not jump to the issue of sihr. If you feel there is sihr involved, then start reading Quran and see the effects. Start reading Quran because you don't need to go to anybody, you can do it yourself. Start reading Quran extra and giving the adhan in your house and praying and whatnot and see if there's an effect. If there's no effect at all and nothing changes, then this is nothing to do with sihr. It's just, again, the natural ups and downs of uh, of life. So, uh, how we have 10 minutes left and there's so much to do. How do we combat magic? Once we know, so suppose a diagnosis has been done, right? Now again, as I said, some diagnosis is pretty self-evident, it's obvious. If uh, another, so, okay, subhanAllah, so much man, I don't even know what I, I'm skipping over, I'm skipping over. I can't because we have to go somewhere too is the problem. We have an engagement or else I would delay Isha. We're skipping over so much, but I need to talk about one thing before I talk about co combating magic and that is possession. Possession. The issue of possession. Now, is every case of magic involving possession? No. Of course, possession is real and there are evidences in the Quran and in the Sunnah to talk about possession. This is something that is cannot be denied that the jinn sometimes do overtake the body. And the person sometimes loses consciousness himself and the person becomes the jinn. And sometimes the person loses control but not consciousness. So the person can see himself as if in a dream but the, he cannot control himself, right? And sometimes the person never loses control or consciousness but knows that the jinn is inside him. So there are levels of possession. There are many levels of possession. Does every sihr involve possession? No. No. Possession only occurs in the worst type of sihr. Much sihr occurs without any possession. Let's call it jinn irritation. So the jinn will simply be assigned to you to make your business fail. To give you no child basically. Always you have the miscarriage as we said, right? So it's not living inside of the body. But it's just accompanying. And remember, when the jinn has a thousand years to live, what does he care about your 60 years or 50 years? To, you know, to him, it's just like, you know, like what we consider a day or two. And as we said, they get the reward or they get their punishment. So it's not a problem for them to spend 50 years 
of their lives, it's like a fraction. No big deal for them to do that. Uh, and they and there are cases of jinn of of um, passing down generations, where somebody you know did sihr for multiple generations. So the father, then the son, then the son, like three generations for, and the jinn's doing it because can live much longer than you. So uh, there are many cases of sihr that don't involve possession. The jinn will rather just be around in your vicinity, maybe even come back and forth into your life every few weeks to monitor the situation, right? And this is the most difficult type of sihr to battle and the least effective in your life, meaning harming your life. Because the less the jinn is in your life, the less you'll feel the sihr, right? You see what I'm saying here, right? That the sihr of the jinn just coming in once in a while and monitoring, let's say your business or you know, uh, giving you a pain, let's say a headache or whatever, or lack of child. So the, the jinn doesn't have to be living inside of you. Every few weeks it checks and does some problem and then goes away. That is difficult to combat because he's not there sometimes. So it is even possible you will read Quran for an hour. Nothing will happen because the jinn's not there. That's why I said you need to make a habit of reading Quran. You need to make a habit so that once the jinn is there, it will react because it has to react at the Quran. It has to react at the Quran. And the worst type of sihr is when the jinn is inside of you living. And as we said, it doesn't have to be possession. It could just be inhabiting a part of your body. Uh, whether it's the stomach, whether it's the brain, whether it's the back. And wherever it inhabits, there will be extra pain or tingling, spiny sensation or pins and needles at that space. Or heat, you know, hot and cold. Uh, for no reason. And again, you go to the doctors like everything seems fine here. You have rashes in one place. I don't know. Everything seems fine here. You know, you have stomach aches and you don't understand why the doctor saying everything's fine. So wherever the jinn is living will have some impact on you physically, because obviously it's unnatural for the jinn to be living there and it is inhabiting that area. So that type of uh, jinn inhabitation is easier to detect, but it's not easy to kick the jinn out. And Therefore, we get to the final point here. So we talked about possession and, 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 and sihr. And we said, possession only occurs at the worst type of sihr, where the jinn enters the body. And we also said that there's different types of possession. There's the type where the jinn just goes inside of you in and out. And that's actually, you don't even need to have sihr to do that. Because our Prophet said what? That your qareen goes in and out of you. Your qareen zigzags inside of your bloodstream. There's no sihr involved. It's just he's going to whisper to you and then leave the body. Okay, so this is common, and it is possible for the sihr to come and uh, just you know do that and then and move on. And then the worst type, as we said, is complete uh, possession. Complete possession, where in fact uh, the person takes over the body. Sorry, the jinn takes over the body, and does things. Now, subhanallah, it's really interesting here. Again, time is so much limited, but. If you look at some of the worst cases of crime and murder that take place, the people that do it, a lot of times will say, what will they say? I don't know what came over me. Many times I don't even remember, right? Many times they'll say, and every once in a while, still you read in the news. I mean, even last year, I remember of a case where there was no murder committed, but a lady just disappeared for months and the police were just wondering where, and this is was in the, the Boston Globe, I think it was. Uh, she was a student at MIT or one of these places. So the whole search out and everything. And then all of a sudden, she is quite literally found by the Coast Guard in the middle of a rock somewhere in the ocean. And to this day, people are scratching their heads. Where did she go? How did she end up? And she has no clue. No, she's literally, it blanked out. One day I'm in the library, next day the Coast Guard's picking me up over there. Right? Now, these types of stories are pretty common. And one point I have to mention that uh, the issue of possession deals a lot with psychiatry. And uh, Muslim uh, uh, psychologists and psychiatrists should be aware that some mental problems are hormonal and whatnot, and some of them are gin related. And they need to do their own research. And I've been asking many psychiatrists about this and a number of them have told me of instances in their own case study where for them it's clear that there is a jinn involved and they just can't do anything. Uh, so psychiatry is a real science. Sometimes there's a mental imbalance. Sometimes people, some people are crazy, you know, some people are crazy, but sometimes it's jinn related. And how do we know the difference? 
primarily through the Quran and the Adhan. See what happens and the impact that happens. If there's an impact, then something is, is there. And also to get this Dr. Jekyll, Mr. High type of mentality that one minute you're the regular Ahmed that we all knew, and then the next minute you become a stranger we never heard of before. And you have superhuman strength or... Hmm? Mood, no, mood swings that are inexplicable and there's a dual personality and you know the bloodshot eyes and the su this is actually real the, the type of horror movies is actually real you get more powerful you get angrier it's literally as if you're talking to somebody you've never known even though that person's your child or your cousin or your spouse and you're talking to somebody the voice changes it becomes gruffer and deeper all of these horror movies as I said there's an element of truth there's an element of truth in this, and it's not coming totally out of uh, out of the blue. And you're dealing with this person, and this person is not the person you knew. That's a state that the jinn is has taken over. Uh, we conclude in five minutes, inshallah ta'ala. I'm going to have to not have any questions. I'm sorry, but this is more important. Uh, that how do we combat magic? The final point. Once we know somebody has sihir done on him, and we've verified this, how do we combat it? Remember that you are reaching out to another world, and that is the world of the jinn. And you do not have the physical strength to combat the jinn. You only have one power, and that is la hawla la quwsa illa billah. Allah has the power over the jinn. So the only way to combat sihr is to reach out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's a different world. And Allah can nullify the sihr like he did to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the power of the Quran is the most effective in eliminating the jinn. The jinns literally burn when they hear the Quran. Literally, they burn. And so, the number one way to combat sihr is through the Quran. And especially the surahs that the Prophet told us are extra special. Fatiha, Ayatul Kursi, the last verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, the entire Surah Al-Baqarah are Prophet linked it to combating sihr. Falaq and Nas, right? All of these are especially powerful in combating sihr and continuous recitation. Uh, you don't need to go to a specialist, a raqi we call them. You don't need to go to a specialist, but it is advisable to for one simple reason, and that is that you are not knowledgeable of how to do these things. And it's better to go to a, a specialist to do that. And when you go to a specialist, make sure that the specialist you go to is of correct theology. Because most of the people involved in combating magic are themselves magicians. Most of the people involved in combating magic, most, not a minority, most of them, in that when you go to them and you pay them the money, they will contact other jinns to kick the first jinns out. Now, what's the problem with that? The other one takes over, right? And there might even be a war going on between, literally, there's a mafia out there. There's turf wars going on. And the body of the person becomes, and I mean, I am telling you, I have dealt with multiple cases, multiple cases, that the sihr I'm dealing with is actually the second level and not the first level. That the person that I'm reading over is actually affected by the guy they went to to help him. And it actually backfired and I have to deal with this case along with the first case, right? Never, ever, ever fight magic with magic because it will only get you more magic, more sihr. How do you know that the guy you're going to is a magician? Very simple, very simple. What is he asking you to do and what is he demanding of you? Now, by the way, money is not a, a criterion because even righteous people might ask you money. Because at the end of the day, you're a Quran teacher. I mean, don't, doesn't the Quran teacher need to get paid? Right? So asking money in and of itself is not a sin. And the Quran teacher has the right to say, I want $30 an hour, $50 an hour, $100 a month. He has the right to say that. So a legitimate Raqi can also say, look, I'm going to charge you this much per session. That's no indication whether he's right or wrong. Right? What is an indication? What is he doing and what is he asking you to do? That's the indication. What is he doing? If he is doing something that is mumbo jumbo, bizarre, weird, superstitious, you know, telling you to sacrifice a chicken and take the blood, okay? And this is very common, very common, right? Telling you to take a, I mean, anything that sounds, this is pagan. 
This is go bury something in the middle of the night, right? If the magician asks you for an item of clothing, or, sorry, not the magician, the one who's combating the magician. If he asks you for an item of clothing or hair or whatnot, if, and this is another sign, if he asks you for your mother's name or the mother's name of the one that you're treating, know that the person you're talking to is a magician. Doesn't matter how long the beard and how big the belly. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Because the only person who asks Look, you come to me and I'm treating Sihar. It doesn't matter to me what your father and mother's name is. How is that relevant to me? I, there's, a, there's a case, right? Just like the doctor when you go to, your mother's name is not going to help the doctor cure you. Correct? It's nothing to do with it. Right? So why do the jinns ask? Why do the, why do the jinns ask? Because in the world of the jinn, in the world of the jinn, they need to know your mother's name. Because Allah says, call them by their fathers. And the shayateen want to disobey Allah. So they will call them by their mothers. Allah says, ud'uhum li aba'ihim. This is in the Quran. And the shayateen want to do everything opposite. We eat by the right, they'll eat with the left. We do this, they'll do that. So anyone who asks you, what is the name of the mother of the person? Anyone who asks you for clothing, for hair, Anyone who without examining the patient or asking about the patient tells you the status of the patient. And this is very common as well. You go to the Molvi Sahab, the Pir Sahab back home and you pay him the money and say, ah, my cousin, tell me, is he afflicted or not? And he does his mumbo jumbo, closes his eyes and he goes, oh, yes, I will tell you there's sihr done on him. How did this man know sitting in Timbuktu? How does he know of your cousin here in Memphis? Now, unless he says, tell me about his symptoms, that's a different story. You can come to me, and even then, and those of you that have come, they know, and by the way, I don't do this too often, I've tried my best to do but you can come to me and I'll say, bring the patient to me. I will never pronounce a judgment just secondhand. Even you doctors, do you pronounce a judgment secondhand? What do you say? Bring me the patient, let me see the result, let me do the tests on him. Correct? Right? Anybody who without examining the patient, simply by knowing his mother's name, simply by getting some clothing item, says he's doing an analysis on this person know that this person is also contacting the jinn. 110% without any doubt about it. And I said it doesn't matter, I'm making fun of the beard and whatnot, I mean, in the sense that because there's an aura of religiosity. He might even be the sheikh of a masjid. He might even have the, it doesn't matter. Because there has to be a perception of righteousness to get his business customers, right? Anybody who's asking you for clothing item or for the name of the mother or asking you to do something paganistic, that person is a magician. It doesn't matter what facade he has painted. It's impossible that a person who is a mu'min will ask you about the name of the mother unless they're calling out the jinn themselves. Okay, so how do you know it's legitimate? If he asks you to read more Quran, to pray often, to do dhikr, to give the adhan, to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to pray tahajjud, to follow the sunnah. In other words, standard stuff. If the only thing he's doing is reading Quran and the adhkar, then you know this person is legit. And that's the main criterion of separating the righteous from, from those who are not righteous. Uh, and again, so much more can be said, but uh, quickly, some of the things are okay to do, inshallah ta'ala, not a problem. So to write the Quran, and it has to be Quran, and put it in water to drink. Not a problem, inshallah ta'ala, uh, to, uh, to blow the Qur'an onto something and give it to you. Again, if, you, if it's the Qur'an, not a problem as well. Uh, even to write Qur'an as long as it is Qur'an and put it on the body, but you have to read it, make sure it is entirely Qur'an. Otherwise, and with this we have to conclude, I'm sorry, but it's getting late. Any time somebody gives you a paper or an item that has symbols, boxes and squares, Weird garbage here and there, squiggles and lines and whatnot, right? Numbers. So you have grids with numbers is the most common. Anytime somebody's doing this, this person is not following the Quran and Sunnah. This is numerology and this is a method of communicating with the jinn. To have numbers and to have boxes and squares and pentagons and whatnot and in each one. Now, these types of papers are typically surrounded by a little bit of Allah and His Messenger here and there. So it'll say, Alif, Lam, Mim, Ham, Mim, Ayn, Sin, Qaf, Bismillah. 
But then in the box is nothing but numbers. Right? It might even say uh, that some type of Quranic stuff is there. But if you mix Tawheed and Shirk, what's the net result? Shirk. So don't be confused if there's one ayah or one name of Allah, just because it has Allah's name. SubhanAllah, even the mushrikun believed in Allah. Doesn't mean anything. All of it has to be Quranic or adhkar. Then we say it's permissible. But if there's weird stuff that you don't understand, languages you don't understand, scripts and symbol, you don't understand numbers, boxes, grids, all of this is communicating with the shayateen and it's not a part of our religion of Islam. To conclude, uh, this point is that uh, magic in reality is not something to be terrified of any more than you would be terrified of a natural uh, calamity or cause. And uh, magicians are evil people who have quite literally sold themselves to the shayateen and in return the shayateen do their tricks and favors for them and the only way to combat them is to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the more religious and righteous you are the less the impact the sihr will have on you when it is done but even the most righteous man or woman can be afflicted with sihr and the only cure to sihr is extra religiosity and turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the easiest way which we did not get into at all is to get to the item of sihr and to destroy it so that the effects of sihr are lifted up but that's typically not the most common way because it's difficult to get to the item but if you're able to then this is the easiest way to do it otherwise you don't need to get to the item because our Prophet was cured simply by Faraq and Nas may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who are protected from sihr, uh, whom the shayateen do not harm. We ask Allah's protection, we seek Allah's protection from the evil of those who blow onto knots and from the evil of the jinn and the shayateen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to always protect us and our families and our loved ones from all even in this world and in the next. Uh, we don't have time for Q&A. We'll just break now for Salat al-Isha and maybe we'll have uh, another session, maybe another time, inshaAllah ta'ala. Experience the beauty of Islam and bring happiness into your life with our app One Islam TV. You will have access to a wide variety of interesting documentaries, inspiring lectures, and so much more. Download One Islam TV from the Apple or Google Play Store today.